Welcome to the Genetics Podcast. I'm really excited to be here today with Dr. Barry Singer. He's a neurologist, and in particular, he focuses on multiple sclerosis. Dr. Singer is the founder of the MS Center for Innovations in Care in St. Louis, Missouri, which is one of the largest comprehensive MS centers in the Midwest of the U.S., Their center was a research site in the first FDA-approved oral treatment for MS and also the first site in the region to begin trials on repair in MS, uh, which is often called remyelination. Um, Okay, so normally the intro would stop here, but uh, unlike most neurologists, Dr. Singer also has a very successful and much-loved podcast called MS Living Well. Um, So he's not just a a great doctor and researcher, but also uh, a really talented communicator. So I'm, I'm very excited to be here with you today, Dr. Singer, and talk about your career, how medicine is evolving, um, and about your your specialty in MS in particular. Sounds great. Thanks, Patrick, for welcoming me to the show. Great. So just to kick off, I wonder if you could take us back to the beginning when you became interested in studying medicine. I know you went to, uh, we were talking about this before the show, you went to Duke as an undergraduate. I went to UNC, so we're arch rivals in that respect. But then you went to, to Columbia for medical school. How did that come about? And at what, what age did you realize that you wanted to become a, a neurologist or, or a doctor more generally? Well, it started really in college. So I took an introductory psychology class and got into biological psychology and what the neuron was doing. And, and so I ended up becoming a neuroscience major in college and got also interested in um, immunology um, because they were both areas that were just booming in terms of our understanding, you know, complex uh, systems that we really didn't fully understand. And HIV was actually, at that point, was just kind of taking off, and people had to understand the immune system if we were going to treat AIDS. So it um, really started early on, um, although my grandmother had uh, Parkinson's, so I knew our, um, you know, I was very familiar with neurology from a young age, um, and her neurologist was kind of like a family hero. I ended up going and practice with him one day, so, so I always wow. kind of knew about neurology for a long time. Um, but then I, you know, I realized I, I got very interested in working with MS patients during resident, uh, during medical school, um, and it looked like there was a lot that we were going to be able to do for MS, and it turned out to be true. What was it about MS in particular that got you excited? It, it is a combo of the immunology and the neurology, I guess. Do you yeah. how, do you think about it in terms of that intersection? Because there's really no no way to. Um, to tease those two apart, right? Both are kind of right. fundamental. Right. I mean, it's really an immune disease, um, just attacking the nervous system. So, but, you know, when you start working with patients that are, um, you know, some very young, the average age to get diagnosis between 20 and 40, and you can see the how the impact of this disease was having on their lives. And, and it looked like because the the technology um, and all our science has been rapidly evolving that I figured that we would be able to make a big impact on these people's lives, which came out to be true. Yeah. What, what was it when you first, when you were first getting started that you were most excited about and, and what has come to fruition and then where are we now? So when I did my fellowship, I was at the National Institutes of Health, and one of the things we saw is people with MS have these active areas of inflammation, active spots in their brain that you can see that light up with contrast. So when you put contrast in a vein, active areas of inflammation light up. And some people with MS had a lot of activity, and we found that we could start an intervention. Um, The first treatment approved for MS was interferon, and you add interferon on, and you can see dramatic reductions within a month of this active inflammation going on in the brain. And that ended up becoming a protocol for a whole generation, multiple generations of medications that shut down active inflammation. Some of our first uh, agents that came on the market prevent about 80% of the new spots from forming on the brain, or lesions, we call them. And, but now we have new generations that are 98% better than that. So we have become very, very far in our ability to shut down the immune system so that we can, um, so that we can prevent inflammation in the brain. And what this does is individuals with MS have relapses. Um, 85% of people start out with what we call relapsing remitting disease. So they have a symptom, let's say numbness in their legs that ascends up to their torso. That might go on for a few months and then get better. Or they might lose vision out of one eye. 
So many of these medications prevent these new attacks from happening. Um, so they prevent this, these acute bouts of neurologic symptoms. The biggest concern over time is some people transition in more progressive disease where they start to get weaker and weaker and their balance off. And some people, you know, it's 10 years later, some 20 years later. So what we're trying to do is prevent people from going into the progressive phase of the disease. How, how challenging is that to do? And, and how, how many people, you know, maybe for those who don't know as much about MS, how many people are affected by it? And then how many people are affected by the, the progressive forms of the disease that, that sound like are the hardest to control? So there was a recent National MS Society went back and looked at medical records. So they did a survey of people with both uh, like Medicare and Medicaid as well as private insurance. And um, realize that when you pull the numbers together, probably over 900,000 people in the United States are living with MS. Globally, um, it seems to be about 2.5 million. But if there's 900,000 people in the United States, there's probably a lot more globally. Right. And so the, those numbers just changed. Uh, for a long time, it was considered 400,000 in the United States. So this new survey really amped up the number of patients that we really, people living out there with MS that we think. Now, most, um, some old studies have shown without treatment, 90% of patients will go on to progressive MS over 40 years without treatment. What we're seeing wow. is those numbers have come down. So in the modern era, we're seeing it's more like 60%. Um, and, you know, now that we have a lot of highly effective drugs, we see if we intervene early with these highly effective medications that we can even reduce that further. So each generation, um, and you can see people, uh, you know, unfortunately I treat generations. So sometimes it's a parent and now their child's diagnosed. Um, it's a small risk, but it is a risk. And we see early intervention in the younger generation end up doing much better. I, I'd, actually, it's maybe a good segue into some of the genetics of the condition. It's, a, it's certainly a condition that has a genetic component, although it's in no way simple. I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the understanding of genetics and inheritance within families, uh, what we know today, and, and how that's evolved over the 20, 25 years that you've been practicing. Yeah, I mean, the incidence hasn't really changed, like how, how, it, uh, how it goes through families. But generally what happens is if a mother has MS, um, the risk to a daughter is about 3 to 5%, depending on which uh, study that you look at. And a son even less, 1 to 3%. So the vast majority of uh, people um, with MS can... You know, don't have to really worry about that when they, we, if they want to conceive, and many of our patients do go on to have families. Um, it shouldn't be a deterrent. Um, it's not a strongly genetic disease. Um, and a sibling, about 5%. Now, if you look at identical twins with exact same DNA, about a third will develop symptoms of MS, but up to two-thirds will show lesions on their MRI scan, but be asymptomatic. So even having the exact same DNA is not 100% uh, for MS. So there are some environmental triggers as well, since it's not all genetic. So one is low vitamin D. And so we find that low vitamin D levels are a trigger for uh, MS. This is based on military recruits. So we have baseline blood work, and we can see who got MS and who didn't. Smoking before age 17 increases your risk of getting MS. Um, Epstein-Barr virus. So having uh, exposure to Epstein-Barr um, seems to be strongly correlated with MS. Now, a good chunk of the world has been exposed to Epstein-Barr virus, um, but an extremely high percentage of people with MS have been exposed to infectious monovirus. Um, and then we also have childhood obesity seems to be a trigger. And so we know obesity is a problem globally, so we're seeing uh, that can be a risk factor, particularly in, in women. Most people with MS are women, so in, up here in the Midwest, it's about 75% are women. We used, to, we used to think it was two to one, but like many autoimmune diseases, we tend to see women more affected. Unfortunately, men tend to do worse from the disease, um, but women are more commonly affected. Why is it that women are more commonly affected? I, I know this is the case across autoimmunity, and there are a number of, of uh, theories floating around. I, I wonder what if you, if you have any insight as to why that is. We still haven't quite figured it out. Um, and people have looked at all kinds of uh, hormonal aspects. For example, um, in pregnancy, people with MS do better. Um, part of it is you have something in your body that's only half genetically like you, so your immune system becomes immune 
immune tolerant to the fetus right. growing in the womb. Um, but people have looked at estradiol, the hormone that goes up in the last trimester of pregnancy, to see if it would help with MS, but it didn't seem to pan out in a clinical trial. So we're not sure if it's, uh, if it's hormonal or not. Interesting. Yeah, that it seems like one of the great um, biological mysteries to, to be cracked, hopefully, in, in the next couple of decades, because it seems like there's some, there's some deep biological insight there as to why, but no one, no one seems to have figured it out yet. Yeah, that's correct. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your approach working with patients and, and how the podcast comes into play, because this strikes me as something that most uh, most neurologists don't do. Um, but I think it's an amazing initiative. And I know you've got tons of, I think you have 4.9 stars or something like that on iTunes. So people are clearly uh, really getting something out of it. How did that come about? And how does it fit into your, your philosophy of care more generally? Well, it started, the MS Living Well podcast started kind of an outbranch of uh, the website, MS Living Well, which I started in 2007. So early on, uh, actually just before I opened my own center, um, was, you know, there was very little information out there for patients living with MS. So there was a few boards, there was something called MS World, and people were putting information on, but it wasn't... Uh, it was basically a little bit of the Wild West, so you could have any kind of theory, conspiracy theory, right. or, you know, some of it was useful information, but it was all mixed. Um, and frankly, the National MS Society had limited information on the website at that time, um, and there were some pharma websites, but they were kind of uh, very lawyered, <laughs> so very limited right. in what they could say. So um, I thought that it was very important to have physician-curated information out there. So I created the website um, in 2007, and it's been a resource in over 190 countries. So um, focus on, there's animated videos on understanding MS, and and uh, we have an MRI video that I think has got over 180,000 views on YouTube. So wow. understanding your MRI, because people get these MRI reports, or they get the MRI scan, and maybe the doctor didn't review it with them, and they want to have more information. So when they're empowered when they go into the exam room to have a conversation about their scans. So it's all about patient advocacy. It's all about having people have the tools and information so they can help make decisions themselves. And it's even more important now because um, we have over 20 treatments for MS. And uh, there's a lot we can do in terms of, we call them disease-modifying therapies. So there's a lot of benefits and risk in trying to figure it out. Plus, um, there's a lot we can do in managing the symptoms of MS. So about 90% of people with MS have fatigue and a uh, high percentage have bladder dysfunction and, and stiffness and spasticity and pain and memory problems. So there's a whole array of good symptom management and then wellness. So one of the things I did with the podcast is I realized some of these topics are very complex. Um, you know, how to, what's your treatment strategy? Do you go in with an aggressive treatment up front to prevent disability over time? Or do you start with something safer and then escalate? So one's, on, you know, treatment strategies. Some are managing these complex symptoms like fatigue, ways to manage fatigue or dealing with memory problems. Other podcasts take uh, complex topics like cannabis. It's not black and white. Who's a good candidate for medical marijuana? Who's not? You know, what are the pros? What are the cons? Pregnancy and MS is a huge issue. So what I'd like to do is take these complex issues, some of them that I spend a lot of time talking about in the exam room, and then to give it to a broader audience, pull in some you know, global MS specialists that have a lot of insight, and let's tackle it and, and talk about the nuances because nothing is straightforward. And, and each person, the more information they have, the more they can go back to their healthcare provider and come up with a tailored, personalized approach to their disease. Yeah, I, I love it. And it seems like such a way to em empower people. Not everyone can have, uh, you, sh you strike me as a very thoughtful and, uh, and, and great neurologist and, and not everyone everywhere in the world has that. So to be able to scale some of these conversations, give anyone anywhere the opportunity to listen and then start this conversation with their doctor or, or, or whoever, or family or whoever it might be from a, you know, from a, from a, like much higher starting point because they've spent hours, you know, as if they were in the exam room with you asking questions and, and learning it, it. It seems, it seems like something that should be integrated more widely into the, into the medical system in, in some way. I mean, do you think about 
do you think about productionizing that in in across other diseases in other way because it, it feels like it should it, it should exist on a wide scale yeah it, it really is quite useful to have information when you go into an exam room we have very limited information you know a lot of people don't have a lot of information when they go into an to an appointment and you have a limited face to face time with the doctor you know or the yeah. nurse practitioner or a phys- physician assistant you know there's a limited time to be in there and frankly in the united states we have a little more luxury of time but you know some parts of the world uh, you know, appointments are limited. I mean, like minutes, um, sometimes 12 minutes or less. And so, you, and it may be one appointment every 18 months in parts of the world. So it's really important to have as much information so you can maximize that time. I find that's one of the things that's very useful for people uh, with any disease is to write down the few things, you know, three or four things on a card that you want to address at an appointment. Pop that right down on the desk. So that way the doctor doesn't do his agenda or her agenda. And then as they're walking out of the room, you're like, well, what about my questions? And they already yeah. got their hand on their door. They're already in the next room. So I think it is important that you um, know what you want to uh, achieve. Now, for people with MS, sometimes they would be looking at their scan. So make sure the scan is loaded. So it could be loaded into the into the into your neurologist's healthcare system. So that way you can view it together or bring the CD in. Um, but really, uh, and be on time, be prepared, bring someone with you. So if you can, with COVID, it's a little trickier. Um, but bring someone with you that... Uh, can uh, be another set of years. Um, so that way, you, when you leave your appointment, you make sure that you understand uh, the game plan and, and you're on board with it. Yeah. I, I, one of the earliest guests on the podcast was Eric Topol, who's a you know, very, very famous medical doctor in, in the US. And he painted this amazing picture of the, of the doctor-patient relationship in the future, where technology takes care of a lot of these points, things are ready, notes are taken automatically through, you know, voice recordings, and you can really focus on that relationship. And I think the upfront education is is a big part of that as well. So people feel like they're they're coming in really understanding what the what the options are. Yeah, actually, I talk into a microphone while uh, and it types for me, so I can look directly in the eyes and we can have a conversation. So I'm not sitting there typing during conversations. I'm actually oh, so you do that already? Yeah, and it goes it goes voice to text immediately and it's pretty darn accurate. So I can be looking at someone and kind of repeating some of the things that they're telling me to make sure that I'm capturing that correctly. And then we look at the scans together and, but it is a, uh, you know, we have a lot of complex issues when we're trying to figure out a personalized approach to treatment. So, you know, we really have to look at, um, you know, what is the disease? How aggressive is the disease? Do they have, you know, I saw a new patient yesterday, you know, do you have a lot of, you have a lot of lesions in their brain, you're a higher risk for disability. Um, do you have spinal cord disease? Are we going to be more aggressive? What do you do for, you know, and, you know, how, so what's the prognosis of the disease of the individual? Do they have a lot of relapses? Do they, Poor recovery from the first relapse is a bad sign. And then we look at their, um, so we got their disease, then we have to look at who that person is. So older patients, their immune system is not quite as competent, so we call it immunosenescence. So as you age, your immune system isn't as robust, and you're more at risk for serious infections, uh, COVID, you know, so so we're worried about malignancies. So older patients, we may not want to take as aggressive immunologic uh, suppression, you know, we don't want immunosuppression, more immunomodulation for those older patients. And then, um, but younger patients with very active inflammatory disease, we may want to be more aggressive. You know, are you planning to have a baby in the next uh, year or two? Um, what do you do for a living? So we look at the individual, you know, are you someone that, um, you know, it needs to travel? Um, can you take a medication regularly? Um, you know, what's your experience with medications? Are you someone that goes more natural <laughs> that doesn't want to take uh, prescription medication? You know, so we have to kind of work through. So it's getting to know who your individual patient is and then trying to match everything together. And it's complex. Uh, so we have a lot of different options. Sometimes people have other comorbidities. For example, um, if you have another rheumatologic disease, then or psoriasis, um, so rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and sometimes our treatments, we can kill two birds with one stone with the treatment. Um, and then other things, uh, some treatments aggravate other uh, immunologic diseases. 
prior history of malignancy. So we have to, it really becomes a um, uh, very, you know, a synthesis of all this. So it becomes a, quite an art of medicine. So you want your provider to understand all the nuances and then work with you to come up with some good options. And then we have this uh, uh, shared decision-making model. So what that means is that we sit down with the patient, really have kind of a conversation about where they're coming from, how much risk they're willing to accept, how much risk they don't want to take, and then really come together and come up with a game plan together. How, how, do, you, how do you approach, I know you all have been involved in a number of new research studies, clinical trials and other clinical research studies over the years. And what strikes me as a challenge that you must face is now that I think you said there are 20 approved therapies, how do you make the decision around whether you, you, you know, put someone on one of those 20 approved therapies or try something new? And I, I imagine it's part of the conversation with the, with the, with the patient first and foremost, but I'm interested in hearing how, as the, as the science matures and you, you know, 90% of cases you may be able to, or 90% of symptoms you can really knock out. How, how do you think about new, new research and where that fits? Yeah. So we've been, uh, I've done clinical trials on over 35 clinical trials on new therapeutics in MS. And one of the things when we always kind of start evaluating, I'm always getting, in fact, I had in my email last night, a new trial uh, for a new compound. What we always kind of do is a, as a group at my center, the other MS specialists, is we sit down and kind of look at the unmet need. You know, where, what do we really need? Um, we don't have a lot of uh, medications that work in progressive disease. So that would be, for example, a great option. Um, we uh, don't have a remyelinating drug. So we're actually getting ready to do our sixth clinical trial on remyelination in my center. So, you know, can we repair or restore function in people living with MS? So we really look at, um, and we have a medication, uh, you know, for spasticity we're going to be studying, which is symptom of stiffness. So we really try to pick out what we really need. Now, back in the day, you could run placebo-controlled trials. And um, so, you know, you would put people, half, you know, maybe a third or half of the people on placebo and half on drug, but not in this day and era. So when we did a lot of the original oral clinical uh, medications, we have like seven orals on the market now. But a decade ago, we had none. So, um, yeah, it's really amazing. Our center has actually been a site for seven uh, Seven drugs that we did clinical trials on are now FDA approved in the past decade. So, I mean, the advancement's been amazing. Amazing. Um, but we, um, yeah, we really look at unmet need. I think that's the big test, you know. And, you know, are people going to be interested in being in the trial? So if the trial design's set up that, you know, no one's going to want to be in it, then it's, it's not, not worth it. So you got to, yeah, no you know, if it doesn't make sense, like who would want to go in this trial, then doesn't make sense. So, but we really look at that unmet need because we want to advance the science. I imagine they probably approach you all at early points in the process because you can provide that feedback of, of, you know, will people, will people want to take part in this? Does the, you know, does the potential reward match with them having to potentially come off a, a therapy that they're on or, or is there unmet need is, is, do you, do you get approached at all kinds of different stages throughout the process to help plan for these. Yes, and we've been uh, we've been a site for, in fact, phase one clinical trials and remyelination. So we've gone through the whole clinical trial program, and and and, and you know, as leaders in MS, uh, those of us that are highly active in the field also you know, give advice on where, what we need, you know, so what our patients need. And so I think we try to advocate that we're not, you know, throwing out another drug that affects the immune system when we have numerous drugs that affect the immune system we need. Um, so I think that what we're seeing in the field is we're developing uh, new therapeutics. And frankly, as some of the drugs go generic, um, it, it in a way also helps propel um, uh, pharmaceutical companies to move on to the next generation compounds as well. So um, the synergy has been great for patients. Um, you know, I think they, you know, I trained at the NIH. Uh, government funding is extremely important to advance the basic science, which is going to help um, lead the way to new therapeutics at NIH is doing some great imaging studies on looking at myelin repair because we need a, uh, we need a ways that we can 
evaluate compounds quickly. So there's some exciting, um, exciting aspects of that. And, uh, but then we, you know, it's really a partnership with uh, pharmaceutical companies that allows all these new compounds to come forward. I'd love to talk more about remyelination in particular, because this seems like an exciting new area and and something that you all are involved in. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about what that is, where where we're at today and potential for the future. Sure. So neurons, um, so we have neurons are the nerve cells. Um, Some of them are like in your surface of your head and your gray matter. And then they have your brain and then they extend all the way down to your spinal cord. So some are quite long and um, they're coated. um, The the long part of the neuron is coated with something called myelin. And there's cells that make myelin. Um, And the cells in the brain and spinal cord that make myelin are called oligos. And these are long names, oligodendrocytes. So these oligos wrap themselves around and around uh, the nerve cells and create like an insulation around the neuron. And it also supports the neuron. That part of the neuron is called the axon. So myelin protects the nerves, as well as also supports it, and also allows electrical signal to go down the nerve very rapidly. With MS, the immune system attacks that myelin. So it kind of destroys segments of the myelin. Um, and if it's severe enough, it'll actually go right through the nerve itself. So the idea is to try to restore myelin um, to protect that neuron not only in the short term, but it also may prevent progressive disease by over time, those neurons can die if they start to lose myelin. So we want to try to repair that. Now, the exciting thing is in the brain and spinal cord of everyone, um, five to eight percent of the cells are immature oligos. So there's these immature cells sitting there not doing anything. So the idea is how do you turn those on um, to create new myelin? And we find that there's some inhibitory factors, One of them has been this factor called lingo that prevents remyelination. So there's an antibody that's been in clinical trial that takes out lingo. So get rid of the factor that's preventing remyelination. But there's ways to try to recruit those cells into the myelin, into the the lesions or plaques of MS, and then um, try to turn them on and have them mature and turn myelin-making cells. Um, So most of the therapeutics have worked in animal models robustly to create new myelin. So if you give these antibodies or compounds, uh, they work great. One of the novel approaches um, that uh, has been looked at is uh, these micro pillars. And so you create little pillars um, and you have one oligoprogenitor cell in each one. And then you can add a numerous, um, this has been done out at UCSF with Ari Green, that you put numerous compounds on top of these uh, micro pillars uh, it's like an upside down cone and uh, with one huh. little cell on it and you put hundreds, you can do hundreds of these on a plate and then you add all a bunch of different compounds and you see which ones make new myelin. So one of them was uh, clemestine, which is an antihistamine that seemed to work. And then uh, they were able to give, um, then take clemestine in a clinical trial and look at it to, to repair optic nerves and people that had uh, inflammation in their optic nerve in the setting of MS. So there's some cool ways that you can advance the science. So we're looking at all kinds of new compounds, both antibodies and oral compounds that may improve remyelination. Sounds like the one that you just mentioned is like a repurposed compound. Yeah. Is it? So it's it's already known to be safe and, and used in some other context. And this massively parallel upside down cone screen, someone figured out that yeah. it has another use basically. And, and then are there new ones as well? So the antibodies you mentioned earlier are some of those new and, and created specifically for this purpose. Yeah. So there's different approaches. Another one, zebrafish, because you can actually see uh, tra- they're translucent and you can see, right. you know, glowing myelin <laughs> on uh, zebrafish. So there's different models that you can do, but the idea is how do you rapidly screen compounds? And then how do you rapidly screen my compound and, and patients? Um, so that's what we're working on, imaging techniques and trying to advance the, uh, advance the science. And it's really trying to uh, – and it's a developing field, but I think a critical field. And I, I, I always look at it as a moon project, not a Mars project. So <laughs> I think remyelination is doable. Uh, the question is how much function are we going to be able to restore? Is it just going to prevent progression? Are we really going to, you know, obviously I got, I have people that are in wheelchairs or they may have three limbs that are extremely weak and need assistance. And, you know, 
uh, clearly, you know, we'd all love a miracle and, and be able to restore function in people with, um, you know, severe disability from this disease. Many of them were before the era where we had all these great therapeutics. Absolutely. So the, the real promise here is is to not just halt progression, but to to hopefully reverse it. And um, if possible, and if possible. But um, are, have any of them made it all the way through and received FDA authorization? What's the furthest along? No. So everything's uh, we're at the phase two trial level. So that's kind of where there where that's where we are right now. But it's a, it's exciting. I, I we just had our global MS meeting and. And more research was presented. It's called Actrums. It was virtual this year. Um, but it, uh, in past years, I'm sometimes on remyelination sessions. There's about 40 of us in there. And now there's like hundreds of people in the room that are interested in this topic. Uh, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, exciting different approaches to MS. And, and uh, you know, it's going to be great for the, the next generation that gets diagnosed with this disease. That the, they'll live a much better life. Absolutely. You, you've you mentioned it a few times, but I think it would be good to, to talk about COVID and how that has affected the the patients that you work with as, as well as the way you, you do your job more generally. What has what has been the biggest set of impacts for you from this very, very strange last um, eight or 10 months? Yeah, the, the delivering care has definitely been the, the biggest uh, change. When um, COVID hit in March in the United States, kind of mid-March, we went uh, virtual very quickly. We didn't know what the impact of these um, disease-modifying therapies. MS itself doesn't make you more susceptible, but, um, you know, we were concerned about the drugs that we're giving people to suppress their immune system to prevent the immune attack on the nervous system. And so most people did. um, So we went virtual. So it was 10 weeks of straight telemedicine. Um, And now we're about half and half since that time. So I see half a day of patients in the office and then half virtual, and we kind of split it up with our providers. So we're not too many people floating around the the office at the same time. Um, And that's worked out. I mean, some people feel much more comfortable being remote. And... um, the uh, so you have to learn a new skill. Um, so how to examine someone virtually is uh, is a new challenge. Uh, but we've uh, ad- adapted pretty well. So I have people take their their phone or tablet or laptop and they set it on the floor against the wall and give me give themselves a runway and I watch them walk one foot in front of the other and put their heel on their knee and run it down their shin look at coordination um, occasionally someone's brought a safety pin so they were ready to check sensation on their exam and I can look at their eye movements and facial sensation and and so I could do some things remotely I think the most important thing is really having a connection with the patient and talking about where we are with uh, the risk of COVID and MS and on their disease modifying therapy and are we on the right approach should we change our, our treatment um, to minimize risk some of our patients are in skilled nursing facilities with advanced disability or more high risk and then we have to kind of think if they're on a high risk medication is that appropriate do we want to go forward with that or should we shake things up so i think for a lot of people i have a lot of anxiety and so that ability to really talk individually with each person have that face-to-face contact, um, I think is very reassuring. Um, And we talk about the global data. So the global data um, base is uh, some data was actually just presented. And so we have um, in North America, there's over 900 people with MS that have gotten COVID. And for the vast majority of people have done well. The um, approximately 5% of people, unfortunately, have uh, died from COVID and MS, and they tend to be people in their mid-60s and older with advanced disabilities, so wheelchairs, bed-bound, um, with actually two-thirds were not on treatment, and they tend at 90% of people have a lot of other medical problems, so, you know, like diabetes and hypertension. So we really, you know, we want to think, you know, be very careful with patients that fall into that category, um, you know, how safe are we protecting them. And then I also have a lot of patients that are their frontline workers. So I got nurses right. and ERs and, and uh, you know, I got people working in ICUs. I got, I saw a police officer yesterday. Um, so we have EMS folks. So, you know, we really think about, you know, what are their exposure risk and how can we minimize those risks? Fortunately, uh, my first, my uh, first responders have done quite well. 
Yeah, no, it is. Um, I think probably from the very beginning, you had to really weigh up the, the different risks, the medication that is dampening the immune system that might cause, um, you know, slightly higher risk from COVID, but the, the knock on effect of what that would do from the immediate, um, you know, perspective of the of the patient and slowing down progression. So it, you probably had a number of uh, roundtables with other experts to to try to get your heads around what what was the right thing to do and every case is different right so you need to contextualize it based on each individual yeah yeah you know it's interesting when this kind of broke it was actually on march 15th um i was sitting uh, i was at home sunday morning kind of a little freaking out <laughs> about you know we have over 4000 patients at our center and, and just worrying about this whole pandemic you know covid coming and I actually put a tweet out, and I said, um, has anybody seen uh, COVID in MS patients? Because nothing was reported at that point. And, uh, and I sent it out to some of my colleagues in Europe, and uh, it was interesting. Then all of a sudden, in Italy and Spain, people started, like, sharing their experience on Twitter. Um, and it really took off that day. Um, and someone asked me to hashtag it, so I called it hashtag MSCOVID19. Um, and it took off and it's still like a big presence today. And that started leading to, uh, registries and databases. Um, so I've, I've had a couple shout outs in the uh, medical literature now <laughs> that put that, that first right. tweet started, started something, but you know, it is important that we share. It's a really a global community. Um, and many of us are really interconnected, not only in, uh, scientifically and, and and conferences, but we're also um, clinical trials, advocacy. So it's a really small uh, global community, and I think we have each other's back. So I think everyone was very interested in sharing those experiences. And um, there's a multiple sclerosis international federation who's also collecting all the regional and countrywide um, databases to pull them together. So then we know, and some data has been presented, some drugs are higher risk. Now we know that some drugs are lower risk. Interestingly, the, the first drug they got approved for MS is interferon. And interferon is a, uh, interferon beta 1A is, an, is a compound that our immune cells make to fight viruses. So it has some antiviral properties. And we're finding actually a lower risk of getting COVID if you're on this compound. It's an old traditional drug, which requires self-injections, which isn't ideal, but um, it's been around for a long time. And um, so we're finding lower risk. And now the World Health Organization is actually using it, one arm of a clinical trial for COVID. So, um, you know, so it's interesting. So it's reassuring for those patients that are on the compound. So this data becomes very useful. And the drugs that are a little more higher risk, and we have a conversation, how are they protecting themselves? I'm guessing most of the research studies you were involved in probably hit, just hit pause um, for, for a few months. But I was also interested in whether you saw some of them try to pivot to virtual operations. When you just told the story about using the cell phone to watch movement from afar. I'm, I'm imagining that, and you've probably already tried this, but using wearable devices to, to measure movement um, in a much more fine-grained way is, is, is I'm sure, something you all have a, have done a research project on already, but I'm interested in, in whether some of those are have been adopted or, or protocols have been switched to enable this, given the uncertainty um, still around, you know, whether we'll be able to run these studies in, in physical sites or not. Yeah, we are doing, um, actually, we are doing a clinical trial right now. It's called MSPT, and it's uh, basically looking at uh, all those kind of digital sensors, um, digital analysis, including cognitive and physical ability. So we are doing a clinical trial right now on that. Um, although, you know, it was, a lot of things were on pause. Now, treatment, we try to keep treatment rolling during during the, the of peak course. of COVID. Um, now we're, we're back open in terms of doing clinical research, but patients were getting infused. Uh, we continue infusion therapies uh, with, uh, for example, we have a remyelination trial. So we continue going through with with uh, infusion therapies during that period of time, but we were we were not seeing patients in the office, and um, and uh, you know it's uh, it's still so far uh, everything's gone fairly well, but you know we've had patients. We're actually seeing an uprise here in uh, Missouri and Illinois, so we're seeing 
kind of an uptick in COVID recently. So we're, we've, right. had, we've had much more cases in just the past eight weeks than we've had all along. So it's still uh, still a concerning time, but we're masked up around here. Absolutely, yes, yeah, as, as as we should be now that. Um... Yeah, I de- yeah. Now that it's it's back on the upsurge here in the UK as well, yeah. so things are things are are coming probably closer to lockdown. Although I think everyone's concerned about um, the economy as well. It's it's a really tough uh, tough balance to strike, and I think you know there's there's no right answer in some of these cases. You have to you have to do you know we have to protect people through through whatever means possible. Um, so just, I know we're, we're running up close to time here. This has been, uh, a, a, an, an incredible conversation. I've learned a lot. I'm wondering if we could just talk about how you see medicine as a whole evolving in the coming years to, to close up. What, what have you, and I think COVID plays into this. What has, what has changed that you think is here to stay? Um, and, and COVID aside, what, what do you see as the most exciting things on the horizon for the next, um, decade or so? I think we're going to see uh, globally with with information and advocacy and technology adapting that I think patients are going to become much more of a driver in their health care than in the past. Um, and I think I'm, we're going to see this more globally. Um, I, I think you're going to see people have access to digital portals. They're able to see their labs. They're able to see information. We communicate. Uh, the vast majority of our communication is actually through our portal with patients. And I'm giving them test results. Right. Um, obviously, some some uh, things require telephone calls so you can have a nuanced conversation. But I think it's, uh, you know, we're going to see more global advocacy. I think more patients settling for, not settling for whatever care they can get, but getting really the specialized care that they need. And as the world gets more complex, um, the role of specialists, I think, are going to be become important and more important. I think also because the world is becoming more interconnected, we can now do, you know, in the United States, um, telemedicine was not reimbursed. So I'm hoping as we go forward, we're going to have, um, be able to maintain this. Um, so that way we can communicate with patients. You know, we see a dichotomy in care. Um, people in rural America, for example, in rural areas in the United States, uh, sometimes uh, don't have access. They may have a general neurologist who really does not have the depth of background um, to help make these complex decisions around treatment choices. And so to be able to maybe see that person, you know, once to six months and then see me virtually or see me come drive and see me once a year and then do a virtual appointment, you know, that that could be uh, really expanding care for some of those patients that don't have access. Um, and some people don't have access just because of the level of disability and they just feel like they can't get in to get to see that specialist. And then the advancements in science are just, you know, it's just amazing. Um, MRI, we used to have, um, you know, you look at MRIs from 10 years ago and they were terrible. You you couldn't image the spinal cord. And now we have, uh, we went from a 1.5 closed Tesla magnet to, uh, to a three Tesla, and it's just amazing how much more you can see. And now there, there's a seven Tesla magnet just approved. So, I wow. mean, the the ability to image the nervous system is amazing, and and just so much more in terms of technology and therapeutics uh, is uh, it's just really exciting to see. And and you know the the bottom line is about improving quality of life. And when we think about people with MS, uh, you know, if you get significant physical or cognitive disability, you know, you're not able to continue doing what you're doing. And I've had teachers that have come, you know, I can think of a teacher that came in my office who, you know, was in tears because she couldn't teach. It's what she loved to do. And because of disability, it's robbed that of her. Um, of, of her passion, what she loves to do. And, and so the ability to control the disease, to allow people to do what they want to do, it also affects them economically, you know, the ability to support your family, the ability for your children to have opportunity because you're not financially restricted. Um, it's a huge impact not only in that generation but future generations. And, and our ability to con- treat the symptoms of the disease so people's quality of life goes up is very important. So I think these advances are going to have, um, you know, just a huge impact on that individual but the individual's family. And so it's exciting to see um, 
uh, the advancement. Some of us are on Twitter. Uh, we have this thing called hashtag making MS boring. <laughs> and that's, and that is really what it's all about. We're trying to, trying to make this disease as boring as possible that I can talk about their family, their kids and their planned trips after COVID <laughs> and not talk about the disease and what it's taking away. I love that. That's so great. What a what a what a great vision. Well, thank you so much. If if people want to follow you, I know on Twitter you're Dr. Barry Singer. Uh, your website is mslivingwell.org. Is is there anywhere else you want to point people to? Yeah, and then the, the podcast, which is on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, different podcast apps, uh, and there's a link in the blog section on MS Living Well to the podcast. And yeah, we'll put links in uh, in the show notes to yeah. all of those as well. Well, Patrick, I appreciate the opportunity. Of course. No, thank you so much. It was, uh, it was amazing to, to have you on the podcast and really appreciate you taking the time. 